Thank, thank you very much for, for being here today. I appreciate the nice crowd. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the role that this relatively small Navy ship destroyer escort played in uh, the last days of Vietnam. It's a story that hasn't been heard before. Uh, I shouldn't say that. We, uh, we made a documentary about the, uh, about the Kirk uh, back in 2010. The Navy did. Uh, I produced it and it was shown around the country to good results. At first glance, the story of USS Kirk and the Lucky Few, the title of the book, seems a little story, an almost insignificant tale at that. And for 35 years, it remained unknown and untold. And that's probably for a very simple reason. It's a Vietnam story. And those of you who were around during the Vietnam War, and I can see most of you were, <laughs> <laughs> Some of you may have been around for earlier conflicts than that. When our most divisive conflict since the Civil War ended in chaos, and some say shame, in 1975, Americans wanted nothing more to do with Vietnam. Vietnam was a national nightmare that was best left forgotten. And we moved on. The story of the Kirk, a little story, an insignificant one, on the contrary, this is a Vietnam story very much worth telling. And in the next few minutes, allow me to give you a little sample of it. Lieutenant Bob Lemke wandered into USS Kirk's Combat Information Center. Amid the many radar scopes was a large radar repeater that consolidated information from the other displays. One look at the repeater screen put everything into perspective. Each green blip was a ship of some sort, making it easy to quickly see the location of every craft on a master grid. But the screen image appeared odd. The shoreline was out of focus. He motioned to a, a tech who was standing uh, nearby and said, when was the last time this radar was tuned? And the tech said, it was tuned very recently, sir. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the radar. Well, Lemke wasn't satisfied with that, so he went topside and he grabbed the big eyes, the big binoculars, and he looked out and suddenly the mystery of the blurry radar screen cleared up for him. Hundreds of boats were heading out to sea in Kirk's direction. As the distance closed, he noted every type of watercraft from small fishing vessel to rubber rafts. The lieutenant was then shocked to see a small wooden dugout with a man, woman, and two children clinging for dear life. They even had a motor scooter on that dugout. That was all they had left in their lives. He said these people were simply paddling out to sea, hoping to get to the rescue ships. The magnitude of a nation's final collapse suddenly became very real and personal to Lieutenant Bob Lemke. For days prior to the fall of Saigon, the byproducts of that relentless conquest by the North were thousands of panicked refugees trying to flee the country in anything that would float. The loss of South, Vietnam, uh, South Vietnam's capital, Saigon, which was really the final chapter in this tragic drama, began with a ferocious ground and artillery attack on the Tan Sanat Air Base on April 29, 1975, at dawn on that day. A special assistant working for the Secretary of Defense, a man named Richard Armitage, recalls looking up and seeing a Vietnamese Air Force C-130 that had been hit by a missile trailing smoke, circling down and crashing, really before his very eyes. We drove through Saigon, he remembers. It was absolute chaos. Looting, drinking, raping, and shooting going on throughout the city. On that same Tuesday that he witnessed this, the 430-foot destroyer escort USS Kirk, a warship that had been designed to protect carrier task forces from Soviet submarines, mind you, the Cold War was still on at this point. This small vessel was cruising near the, uh, the port of Vong Tau, 
as large CH-53 and CH-46 helicopters began shuttling American and Vietnamese evacuees from Saigon. Now those of you who remember the vivid TV images from that period remember the chaos of those final days. People questioned later on, weren't there preparations made for the evacuation? There were still Americans in Vietnam. Of course, the troops had been withdrawn. Paris Peace Accords had seen to that in, in 73. The ambassador, Graham Martin, feared making preparations. He feared that the very preparations of leaving Vietnam would panic the South Vietnamese and their armies would crumble. Well, they were crumbling anyhow. Uh, there were, there were large, uh, large amounts of material that had to be burned. There were, there were names of Vietnamese who had helped us during the war. Their names, their addresses, what they had done. And no provisions had been made to destroy this material. And so the preparations to leave Vietnam were left for essentially the last minute. It was hoped that fixed-wing aircraft could go into Tan Sanut. C-130s, uh, C-141s, and, and, and aircraft such as that could go in to Tonsonet Air Base and evacuate people in large numbers. However, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong were already surrounding the city and they had pummeled the runways with mortar and rockets so fixed wind aircraft could no longer be used. And so they went to Plan B, which was called Operation Frequent Wind, that is the helicopter evacuation of Saigon. As the CH-53 and CH-46 helicopters, which were stationed aboard a task force of approximately 40 ships off the coast of, of South Vietnam, these were uh, amphibious assault ships, several carriers, and, and landing craft and other, other ships, um, the helicopters took off from these, uh, these decks, these flight decks, with the intention of providing a, um, I guess you'd call it a shuttle service. They would fuel, they would go into Saigon, they would land in predetermined locations, soccer fields, schoolyards, and they would pick up Americans who were still there, and again, there were, there were no American troops there in large numbers any longer, just advisors, but there were CIA operatives, there were embassy personnel, and there were these sensitive, I say sensitive Vietnamese, that is the Vietnamese who had helped us during the war, whose lives were not gonna be worth much once the North Vietnamese took over. So this was plan B, frequent wind. And these helicopters went in and they went in and they loaded up and they headed out to sea. Just as suddenly, hordes of unknown contacts, again, this is aboard Kirk, began fogging Kirk's radar screens. This is the second time. And these South Vietnamese Army and Air Force UH-1 Hueys, packed with fleeing refugees, were following the American aircraft out to sea. Imagine the shock of a CH-53 pilot or co-pilot looking in his rearview mirror and seeing perhaps hundreds, at least tens, hundreds of small UH-1s. These were the helicopters we had given the Vietnamese during the war. And now they were filling up with refugees. A pilot would, would have a fueled uh, bird and he would land in his community, a town where he grew up, and he'd take aboard his family and he had room for more. And they loaded these things up. A helicopter designed for perhaps a dozen troops, 10 to, to a dozen troops, were now filled with some, with as many as 25 to 30 men, women, and children. And you've seen scenes of people even clinging to the skids. That some of these helicopters could actually get airborne was amazing, much less staying airborne until they got out to these ships, out, uh, ships of, the, of the task force. Now they had no permission to land on these ships, but they were going to give it a shot anyway. Operation specialist Jim Bongard was glued to his radar screen down in CIC in the Combat Information Center. This is what he remembers. He says, all of a sudden these dots came racing out across the radar screen. They were too fast to even mark. What are these things? And we're calling the bridge, asking for visuals, and they're saying, we have helicopters coming in. And there were just swarms of them. Airman Donald Cox in the ship's chief engineer, Lieutenant Hugh Doyle, recognized what was happening. They saw the excitement of all of this. The sky was smeared with exhaust from all these helicopters. 
And Lieutenant Doyle said, we knew an evacuation was going on and with each helicopter that would pass us, we had an open deck. Now being an anti-submarine platform, the Kirk had its own flight deck. It had its own LAMPS helicopter that would go out and scout looking for Soviet submarines. It could drop sauna buoys in the water and do that type of thing. It could even destroy Soviet subs with torpedoes that it had. But it was out of order. It had a bad engine. So it was in the collapsible hangar on the flight deck. So the entire flight deck wasn't available, but a good portion was. And they're looking up and thinking, well, we have a, fl a clear flight deck. Why don't they land? We could take a couple of these things. We could take at least one. Anyway, Lieutenant Doyle and the others, or the members of the crew, with mounting excitement, with the possibilities, were caught up in all of this. And Doyle said, we never anticipated a helicopter landing on us, but we started talking about it. Wouldn't it be great to grab a helicopter? Wouldn't it be great to take part in all of this? In an attempt to advertise Kirk's hospitality, the ship's first class storekeeper, who had been to Vietnam previously on other deployments, spoke some rudimentary Vietnamese, and he was allowed to, in fact, he was encouraged to begin broadcasting on the air distress frequency. Ship 1087, land here. Of course, that was the whole number of the Kirk. 20 minutes later, Airman Ger Gerald McClellan waved the first Huey onto Kirk's flight deck with a load of refugees. And these refugees were armed, many of them. Some of them had automatic weapons, pistols, hand grenades. And of course, members of the Kirk crew couldn't know whether they were North Vietnamese, whether there were VC involved in this, and whether they would try to commandeer the ship. So the first order of business was to have these folks disarmed. And whatever arms were confiscated from these people were put in a, uh, in a compartment that became, uh, became a, a, a lock or became the, um, what would you call it? Armory. armory. It became the ship's armory. And, and by the end of this whole operation, that armory was loaded almost to the ceiling with weapons. The following night, 30 April, Commander Paul Jacobs, Kirk's commanding officer, received a cryptic message from the task force commander. Now mind you, many other helicopters had landed on Kirk. One landed and then a, they, took, they decided to keep one as a trophy. I mean, that, that was the intent all along, to come home with a trophy, or maybe two. So they took those and they kind of moved them aft with the booms kind of leaning outboard to make more room. Well, they had no idea, but within a short time they almost took a dozen helicopters. There wasn't room for a dozen helicopters. In fact, it was very dangerous to land more than one at a time on the ship. So Captain Jacobs had to make a fateful decision. And those of you who were around then remember seeing those images, iconic images of passengers disembarking from these small Hueys and crews dragging them over to the side and throwing them overboard, throwing, not the passengers, the helicopters, <laughs> to make room for more. It was not a matter of trying to save these birds any longer, which were well in the millions, each one, about maybe two million, a million and a half to two million dollars for one of these aircraft. It was, it was a matter of saving lives. And so that decision had to be made in an instant. And by the way, that decision was made without any permission from the Pentagon or anyone else. I remember when I was writing the book, I interviewed former Secretary of Defense, James Schlesinger. We had a long conversation. And I asked him how much he knew about what was going on out there at that time in the last days of April and the first days of May of 1975. And he said, you have, to, you have to understand, we didn't have sat phones back then. He said, I had to trust my people who were out there to make the right decisions. They were on the scene. They could make a better decision than I could back at the Pentagon. And I, I told him the story of the Kirk, and he didn't know very much about it. And when the conversation ended, he said, Mr. Herman, I believe you have, uh, I have learned more from this conversation than you have. <laughs> what I learned was how little was known back in Washington about what was going on out there. Anyway, uh, the captain received this cryptic message that he was to send a 
motor whaleboat alongside the flagship of the task force, USS Blue Ridge, and they were to take a passenger back to Kirk. He was a civilian. His name was Richard Armitage, just turned 30 years old, a GS-12 at that time. And they were to take their orders from him. Well, this was odd. Naval officers aren't trained or designed to take orders from civilians. There are only two, two civilians in their chain, and that is SECDEF and SECNAV. And generally, they don't take orders directly from those two civilians. But now they're told to take this man aboard, and whatever he says, they will do. <coughs> when he came aboard, mind you, this is the South China Sea in April. It's hot, it's humid, and he's very incongruously dressed in a sports coat. Some say it was a blue blazer, a tie, and a 45 and a shoulder holster. And the skipper said to him, I'm not used to having armed civilians come aboard my ship in the dead of night, upon which Armitage replied in a very gruff voice, which he still has. I'm not used to coming aboard armed in the dead of night, but I've got a job to do. I work for the Secretary of Defense. Then Armitage outlined a secret mission that the Kirk would now proceed on. The remnants of the South Vietnamese Navy, about 32 ships in all, would gather at Khan San Island just off the South Vietnamese coast. These were ships that we had given the South Vietnamese during the course of the war. So it was a conglomeration of cast off ships, some of them from World War II vintage. LSTs, LSMs, Coast Guard cutters, even a destroyer escort from World War II, and a bunch of other swift boats and a couple of fishing boats thrown in for good measure, but there were 32 of these ships. It was really a tall order from this diminutive, for this diminutive warship, USS Kirk. Most of South Vietnam at this time was in the hands of the North Vietnamese. They hadn't quite consolidated their power, but they, had, they were in place to do so. Several South Vietnamese, Viet, uh, Vietnamese pilots had already defected and were flying American-built jets on missions against their former countrymen. The folks on the Kirk questioned this decision to go down. They said, are we going down alone? And the answer is yes. We're going down alone. Now, Kirk was well equipped to defend itself against hostile Soviet submarines. But whether it was well equipped to defend itself against a concerted air attack was something else. It had a five-inch deck gun, which might have taken a toll on some aircraft, but Essentially, the ship was defenseless against a determined air assault if the North Vietnamese decided to contest this evacuation. The following morning, as the sun came up, Kirk had already arrived at Khan San Island, which was roughly 115 miles from where they had been cruising off the port of Vung Tau. What was evident to everyone in the crew was a humanitarian disaster in the making. These folks had expected 32 ships of the uh, former South Vietnamese Navy to be there, and that they found. What they hadn't counted on was the fact that these ships were absolutely crawling with refugees, men, women, children, without food, without adequate water, with no medical care. In fact, Lieutenant Doyle, said it reminded him of someone who might have taken a couple of Hershey bars and put them on a hot summer sidewalk and waited a few hours and came back. That's what it looked like. It looked like ants crawling all over these ships. Kirk's CEO, Paul Jacobs, recalled the scene. He said some of them were anchored, some were not, some were adrift. And they were just loaded with people all the way up to the bridge. I estimated two to 3,000 people on one of those ships. I said, oh my God, 
This is going to be an insurmountable problem. How are we going to pull this off? And when he says, how are we going to pull it off, he's talking about, how are we going to pull it off alone? Just how USS Kirk pulled off the rescue of an estimated 30,000 refugees aboard those 32 ships is the real story. There are a lot of stories connected with the Kirk. The early part of the mission, the early part when they take aboard the helicopters, that's pretty dramatic in itself, and now it's phase two, part two or chapter two. How do they, how do they handle this mission? And that's the subject of my book, The Lucky Few. In 2009, I was completing a book. At the time, I was the chief medical historian for the Navy. I was writing a trilogy about Navy medicine in the conflicts uh, the Navy participated in in the late 20th century, starting with World War II. So I wrote a book on World War II and Navy medicine, world, and then the Korean War and Navy medicine participation in that conflict. And then, of course, Vietnam, which was uh, the war of my uh, adulthood. I wasn't in the Navy at that time. I was in the Air Force. Uh, I saw the error of my ways, and I went to work for the Navy afterward, but <laughs> nonetheless. So I was working on the last uh, of the trilogy, Navy medicine in Vietnam. And I was working on the last, the very last chapter. And of course, that last chapter focused on the humanitarian assistance the Navy provided to the refugees who fled South Vietnam. And to complete that last chapter, I first had to get the stories of those medical personnel. How would I do it? Well, in the old days, I'm not sure how I would have done it, but in the, in the age of the internet, it became a little simpler. It, and it becomes a lot easier for researchers to get to the meat of things when you have the internet. I knew there were 40 ships, roughly 40 ships in that task force. I knew the names of those ships. I suspected that many of those ships would have reunion organizations that would have websites. And what I could do is perhaps gin up a, uh, an email in which I would ask for names of medical personnel who served on those ships. So I did, and I sent an email to, I found 13 ships that had reunion organizations out of the 40. So I sent essentially the same email, a boilerplate email looking for medical personnel to interview, sent it. It was within an hour. It, wasn't no, it was no longer than an hour. My phone rang at BUMED, Bureau of Medicine and Surgery, where my office was. And it was a retired Captain Paul Jacobs of USS Kirk. And I remember saying, I'd like to interview members of your medical staff. And he laughed and he said, medical staff? He said, I had two corpsmen. I had a, a chief hospital corpsman and I had a, a third class corpsman. That was it. That was my medical staff. Well, over the next few weeks, he and I talked frequently over the phone. He did tell me, he said his ship took, uh, had a special role in the evacuation and he told me about the mission going back to Vietnam. And um, I did his oral history, I did his, I, uh, he gave me names of other members of the crew. And before long, I was phoning or emailing other members of the Kirk crew. And um, Captain Jacobs then invited my boss, the Surgeon General of the Navy, Vice Admiral Adam Robinson, invited him to a reunion of the Kirk that was being held that year, 2008. Excuse me, it was 2007. It was fall of 2007. And I remember he was new in the job. The Surgeon General had only been in his job perhaps two weeks, three weeks. He had just taken command. And I got a phone call from him and he said, I, I got this invitation. Well, Captain Jacobs asked me if he thought it, uh, the, uh, the Admiral would accept an invitation to be the speaker at this reunion of the Kirk. And I said, I didn't know. I said, what do you got to lose? Send him an invitation. And he, all he can say is no. So he sent the letter off and I got a call at my office. The Admiral wanted to see me. That's not always a good thing. <laughs> when the Admiral wants to see you, it can be one of two things. Either he's going to give you a medal or he's going to kill you, one or the other, or, sh or cut your career short, let's put it that way. So I went to his office and he said, he's holding up this letter from Captain Jacobs. He said, I got this uh, invitation from Captain uh, Paul Jacobs of the USS Kirk, some kind of destroyer escort or something. He said, uh, they're asking me to be the guest speaker at their reunion, which was going to be held locally in suburban Virginia. <coughs> He says, uh, I'm new here. I haven't accepted any invitations to anything. Why should I accept this? 
what do you know about this? So I told him briefly what I knew about it. He says, well, why should I go to this thing? I said, well, look, Admiral, if you don't go, you're going to kick yourself and wish you had. He accepted. And he went to the reunion. And I remember walking in to that, it was a hall uh, where tables were set up for a banquet. And the first thing we saw as we walked in was a room filled with highly charged emotion. There were former Vietnamese refugees in attendance, a number of them, not only them, but their children, in some cases grandchildren. And there were sailors, former crew members of USS Kirk there. All I can say is there was a lot of hugging and kissing going on. These folks had not seen each other since the rescue in 1975, many of them. This was an opportunity for the Vietnamese not only to thank their rescuers, but it was an opportunity for the crew members to see the results of the work they had done back in 1975. Anyway, the Admiral uh, was introduced after the dinner and he got up at the lectern he had a prepared speech that a speechwriter had written for him. And I remember he took this speech and he threw it down on the table. And he says, I'm not giving this speech. It's totally inappropriate after what I've seen tonight. And then he proceeded to talk from his heart about humanitarian assistance and what the Navy does as far as humanitarian assistance. Yes, we're trained to fight wars. That's what we do. That's Item number one. Item number two is to provide humanitarian assistance on the high seas. And that's a tradition that goes back to the founding of our nation and even before that. Following that event, Admiral Robinson invited Captain Jacobs to come to the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery to have lunch at his office. And he invited me. He says, you're the historian, you need to be there. And we're sitting at, at a nice table, and the mess steward has prepared a beautiful lunch for us. And during the appetizer course, the Admiral says to me, he says, you know, you do documentaries. You've done a number of documentaries for the Navy. You need to make a documentary about the USS Kirk and what those sailors accomplished out there. I figured it was idle lunchtime chatter. The Admiral's making conversation with me. We got to the dessert course. And um, this was probably a major mistake on my part. I said, Admiral, uh, are you really serious? You really would like me to make a, uh, a documentary about this? And his eyes bored into mine, as only a vice admiral's eyes can. And he said, would I have suggested it if I weren't serious? Yes, I want you to make a documentary about this. Aye, aye, sir. I went back to my office after lunch, filled out the necessary paperwork that is required when you start a project like this, and I took it over to what we call the front office. The next morning at 0800, my phone rang. You can come pick up the paperwork. The Admiral has signed it himself. Now I was stuck. Now I had to make a documentary. And it's, you know, you go to a Hollywood extravaganza, you go to one of these Hollywood films, and when it's over and the end comes on the screen, the credits roll for probably 15 minutes. Hundreds of names roll down the screen. I'm looking at me and thinking, I don't have a crew like this. I got a few folks that work at the, the Naval Hospital at Bethesda who work in the TV studio, and they, they've done some work for me in the past, but what do I do? Well, I had to put all, you know, put all my ducks in a row and get everything going to get this project underway. I think at, very, at first I probably thought the Admiral would forget about it, but he didn't. Every time I saw him, I, I think it was just five days later, he said, how's my movie coming? How's my movie coming? It got to the point I had to hide when I saw him coming down the passageway. <laughs> He'd say, Hi, is my movie ready yet? The movie actually took two years to make. And that was two years of challenging research. Spending countless hours going through Kirk's logs and other ships that were involved. I might point out, and I should point out right now, that Kirk was responsible for the first day or so of this operation of rescuing these South Vietnamese ships. Other ships joined. Sister ship, USS Cook. We have a crew member of USS Cook here today. Um, helped out. There were plenty of other ships that, uh, that in, uh, got involved. A couple of seagoing tugs, a couple of uh, landing, uh, landing ships, um, 
USS Barber County being one of them, uh, USS Mobile. There were a bunch of other ships that provided food and water and even a physician at one point and several corpsmen. So this was not a Lone Ranger operation. I don't want to give the impression that it was. It started out that way, but help arrived. The 7th Cavalry showed up and helped. Anyway, we went around the country interviewing not only members of the crew, of the Kirk crew, but also Vietnamese who had been rescued. We got their stories on videotape. And then when we got everything assembled, I ended up having to write a script for this. Again, it's one of those, I guess it was in a sense almost a Lone Ranger operation because we didn't have a large crew of people to put this film together. But I did have help. And after we wrote, we, we, got, we assembled all the components and put them together into this documentary. At the next Kirk reunion in July of 2010, with Vice Admiral Robinson in attendance, we showed the lucky few at this reunion. Shortly thereafter, National Public Radio aired several stories about Kirk's rescue, uh, rescue mission, and that three-part NPR series won national acclaim. On Veterans Day, November 11th, 2010, the Lucky Few premiered at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, which was a very proud moment in my life. If you're from New York and they say you make Broadway, you've made the big time. If you work in Washington, if you make the Smithsonian, that's just as good. <laughs> it became obvious to me that a one-hour film could scarcely do justice to this previously untold story. Why had the incident been overlooked for so many years? As I've already indicated, I think it was because it was a Vietnam story. And it had to do with America's mood in 1975. Moreover, the men of Kirk and the crewmen of other ships who had participated in the rescue never thought they had done anything particularly extraordinary. You've heard this many times from people you call heroes. They say, I'm not a hero. I was just doing my job. That was also true of the Vietnamese who had been rescued. They hadn't told their children. Many of these kids didn't know how their families arrived in the United States. But imagine being a crew member of the Kirk and going down to your local VFW hall or American Legion hall and there are some of your comrades from Vietnam days and they're telling war stories or sea stories. What are you going to talk about? Feeding refugees? Diapering infants? These are kinds of stories they didn't feel like sharing. And again, they didn't discuss it with their family or any of their friends. Writing a book on the Lucky Few documentary, or based on that, I should say, offered new opportunities to tell more of the story and to incorporate what had unfortunately ended up on the proverbial cutting room floor. <clears throat> you know, in most Hollywood films, the book comes first, followed by the movie. I just did it in reverse. But I had the advantage of now adding flesh to the bones of an already larger-than-life event. I had the opportunity to tell a wonderful story of an extraordinary ship and its crew. <clears throat> One of the players in the Lucky Few drama a man who worked for the Secretary of Defense, he was Assistant Secretary of Defense, Eric von Marbod. He pointed out to me just a few years ago the story's true significance. He reminded me that after the war, President Ford's task force for the resettlement of Indochina refugees resettled more than 130,000 evacuees from not only South Vietnam, but also Laos and Cambodia settled these people in communities around the United States. It wasn't long before almost all of them became American citizens. Since Kirk and her sister, U.S. Navy ships, saved more than 30,000 South Vietnamese refugees, that means, think of this, that means one in every four Vietnamese refugees resettled in the U.S. by that task force can trace their new beginning in this nation to the mission accomplished by USS Kirk. It's quite an achievement. Decades later, the true significance of the rescue comes into perspective in very ironic ways. I was going to tell the story myself, but I don't have to. <laughs> 
because the man who witnessed this event is sitting in the rear row and he's going to come up and tell you the story. Former Lieutenant Hugh Doyle of USS Kirk. Hugh? You can just take the mic. All right. I'll stand next to you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, before, I, I, before I tell you this uh, remarkable story, I'd, I'd like to, uh, where's our Admiral Luce look-alike? <laughs> Mike Thomas, would you stand up, please? Mike was a crewman, uh, was the uh, 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 comm officer? I was ASW. ASW officer on USS <laughs> Cook. Uh, Mike, uh, while well, I never left the Kirk, I was the chief engineer on Kirk. While well, I never left the Kirk uh, to go to one of the Vietnamese ships, uh, Mike did. Mike went, went aboard HQ-17, and he was the uh, he was the American officer who took uh, took the receipt of the ship. And it's some kind of jumping ahead. We had to reflag the ships to get him into the Philippines. But um, and I see you're wor he's working on his uh, Admiral Loose whiskers here. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the story that uh, that Jan usually tells when he when he gives this talk is about uh, Newport, and it's about the Newport. Uh, uh, clinic here, right on the base. Uh, I'm retired Navy. I retired here in 1987. Uh, I uh, I was uh, I had a, a doctor assigned to me here at the at, at the base. Um, I got a, a pro forma letter in the mail saying uh, we're reassigning you to a new doctor. Uh, please come in and meet him. And it was Doctor uh, Khan Von Nguyen, Lieutenant Commander, United States Navy Medical Corps. And I said, Oh, that's interesting. A Vietnamese name. So I came in to meet the man. And uh, he looked like a 14-year-old kid. He had, he had braces. He, he was just a little, little guy, very, very intense. And um, as, I was, uh, uh, as I was talking with him, as go, you know, in my initial uh, uh, meeting, I said, uh, can you tell me how your family came to, uh, to the United States? I figured he was born here. Uh, well, he was one year old when he escaped. He was in his mother's arms when he escaped uh, with his family. They, uh, and I said, do you know anything about it? He said, no, my father passed away shortly after we arrived in the States. My mother never learned English to, to, uh, to any extent, so she never talked about it. I had an older sister back then, or I have an older sister who was 15 years old when we escaped, but I don't know anything about it. So I gave him a copy of The Lucky Few, uh, the, the documentary. And I said, here, you, this might be of interest to you. He took it home, watched it. I saw him a couple weeks later on a follow-up. And he said, it was very interesting, but I didn't learn anything more about my family. Well, about three months later, I'm back to see him, and he is over the top excited. And he said, my sister was here on the last weekend. She, was, she came from Seattle, going to Boston with her young daughter to get her into, into college. She stopped to see her little brother, and they watched the, the documentary together. And when the, uh, uh, when the HQ-1, Haikun-1, which was a destroyer escort, formerly the USS Camp, which was homeported here in Newport in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, it was eventually turned over to the Vietnamese. It became one of their capital ships. A destroyer escort became HQ-1. When this little girl, now a mother of this college student, saw the picture, she said she jumped up and said, that's the ship we were on. So they came out on one of the 32 ships that we brought. Um, so, and my, and I got thinking about it later on, I said, what are the odds? What are the odds that they would escape when so many didn't? What are the odds that they would come out to our task group? What are the odds that they would go all the way through their resettlement? This little boy who was one year old at the time would become a doctor. He would decide to join the Navy. He could have gone Air Force, Army, whatever. He decided to join the Navy on his third assignment as a, as a Navy doctor. He comes to Newport, and luck of the draw, the computer assigns me to him. So th come full circle. And, um, but um, uh, by the way, for those of you who are, are trivia buffs, the, the, when we reflagged these ships, the United States Navy end strength, we call the end strength, peaked by 32 ships immediately, <laughs> immediately, because they became officially, as far as the, the government of the Philippines un, uh, understood, vessels, of, uh, ships of the United States Navy. And now the real trivia is two of them were little yellow fishing boats. So <laughs> if anyone ever asked you, did, did, was there ever a commissioned ship of the United States Navy, a little yellow fishing boat, two of them, for about three days. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks, you. <laughs>
he tells it a lot better than I do, so I thought I'd just let him do it. And he did a great job. Thanks you very much. <clears throat> Before I close my talk, I'd like to read a short segment from Chapter 4 entitled The Ride Out of the War. It's, uh, it's the story of, uh, from the, Vietne uh, the Vietnamese point of view, a family of Vietnamese who left Saigon aboard a, uh, a Chinook helicopter and headed out to sea. And I'm going to tell it from their point of view, this, the point of view of the, of the son who's now in his mid-40s, who was just a five-and-a-half-year-old boy at the time. But this is the story as he related it to me. From far off, the wump, wump, wump of a helicopter grew louder, portending another emergency landing. But as the aircraft appeared, Kirk's sailors grew apprehensive. This was not a Huey, but a twin-rotor CH-47 Chinook, the largest helicopter in the South Vietnamese inventory. Kirk's flight deck could not accommodate this bird. The diameter of the rotor disc was so great that any attempt to land would result in disaster. Its rotors would hit the helicopters already stuffed alongside the hangar, those trophies that I mentioned earlier, and or take out the hangar and the ship's radar mast and superstructure with great loss of life. The Chinook's epic journey out to Kirk had begun that morning in one of Saigon's residential neighborhoods. Mickey Nguyen, barely seven, was the son of a Vietnamese Air Force pilot, Major Ba Van Nguyen. The boy heard the chopper approach his grandmother's house where he and his family had sought refuge. The helicopter set down in a soccer field near the house, blowing dust and newspapers in all directions. All my dad's younger brothers and sisters were standing around surprised to see my dad land the helicopter there and pop open the door. The co-pilot came out waving at us to get on the Chinook. There was little time for decision making. We knew that we were to grab our bag and get on that helicopter. This was our chance, our ride out of the war. All hell broke loose, Mickey recalled, his father saying. His father also said it was the Wild West and it was every man for himself. In this case, instead of you and your horse, you had you and your Chinook. With wife and children safely aboard, Ba throttled the engines to full power and lifted off, blowing the roof off a neighbor's house with the Chinook's downdraft. As I learned, at, learned later, those family members who elected to stay behind were forced to pay for that roof on the neighbor's house. It was excitement in a lot of ways, not knowing what you were going to do in the next hour, let alone the next day. But I felt safe with my mom and dad and my family. I know my mom would tell a different story, on the other hand, being frightful for her children, her baby, her daughter in her hand, and another very young brother in her other hand. So for her, very frightful. But for a young six and a half year old, it was a sense of adventure, and one for me will always sear in my memory as the epic moment in our family. My dad said, let's give it a shot. We're going to head out to the Pacific Ocean. I'm hearing US Navy communications out there. Let's head in that direction and let's, let's see how this goes. He heard first on the radio several ships and eventually saw in the distance, as Mickey remembers it, the almighty, it's a word, his, his word, the almighty USS Kirk. Crew members frantically waved off the pilot, but he came around for another low pass. He was determined he was going to land on that ship. This time there were anxious faces pressed against the helo's plexiglass portholes. Somehow the pilot made it clear that he would hover the aircraft over Kirk's fantail so his passengers could jump to the fantail deck. Mindful of his precious cargo and urgent mission, Nguyen motioned for his co-pilot to open the co-pilot's right-hand door. Lieutenant Commander Richard McKenna, who was the uh, Kirk's executive officer, called for volunteers. Their task would be dangerous, to say the least. Stand beneath this massive bird with its powerful downwash, trusting its pilot to maintain his position, and then catch or at least break the fall of the passengers as they jumped. Now mind you, many of these helicopters that had come out previously to Kirk, the UH-1 Hueys, these pilots, 
had never landed on a ship in their lives. The water they had seen was the, generally the water in rice paddies or the Saigon River. Nevertheless, Nguyen coaxed the helo perpendicularly across Kirk's fantail, cockpit port and tail starboard, conscious of his aircraft's rotors. He had to maintain enough height for the rotors to clear the flight deck, which was a, one level up from the fantail deck, and yet get low enough to the fantail deck for the passengers to jump from the right door with minimal chance of serious injury. Below the howling, rotor-induced hurricane, Kirk's sailors awaited the outcome. Mickey recalls, my mom jumped before me and then it was my turn. As I got toward the edge of the door looking down, several crewmen, three or four I believe, all of them with their hands raising up, raising high, stretching out. My left arm held onto a rope and eventually I remember letting go and hoping that the crewmen down there would catch me. They did and it was a happy moment. It was the first step of freedom stepping on the deck of the USS Kirk. In the pilot seat, Bond Nguyen now prepared to execute a maneuver he had never anticipated. Now the Chinook is empty. Everybody is off except for him. The maneuver he had never anticipated or trained for was ditching at sea. Bond flew a safe distance to starboard of Kirk and then using the helicopter's cyclic control between his knees, he eased the helo six tires into the water. With a cyclic control force trim turned on, he was able to keep the huge aircraft in a stable hover while he removed his holstered pistol and struggled out of his flight suit. He then swung the emergency handle on the Chinook's, uh, Chinook's left side door forward 90 degrees and the panel dropped into the sea. It was now or never. He depressed the thumb button atop the cyclic, moved the cyclic to the far right, then released the button. As the Chinook suddenly jumped right, Nguyen leaped from the left door into the water, struggling to thrust his body beneath the surface to escape the rotor blades. Unwanted buoyancy forced him back to the surface. In its death throes, the helicopter resembled a whining, angry beast as its rotors exploded in a fury of hurtling shards. I know it's not fair to leave you hanging. So I will tell you what happened next and maybe Hugh can add a little to the story because he was a witness. Not only was he an eyewitness to this, but he took the photographs that are in the book that actually show this whole operation going on with the Chinook uh, crashing into the sea and exploding. Well, it, it did explode and um, they looked for the pilot and they didn't see anything at first. All they saw was red in the water, the color red in the water. They figured that was it, he was probably chopped up in the rotor blades. They only found out later that that was red hydraulic fluid they were looking at. <laughs> Suddenly a head popped to the surface and there was Nguyen swimming for his life. Well, there were at least a dozen members of the Kirk who leaped into the ocean to save this guy. There were two rescue swimmers. They didn't even got a chance to get into the water. These other guys would <laughs> took off their shoes and they flew into the water. And the motor whaleboat, they sent the motor whaleboat out and it wasn't just rescuing one man, but it was rescuing, I believe, 13 altogether. They had to rescue the 12 sailors. They brought him aboard, a, a true hero. The worst injury of any of those passengers was a sprained ankle and a couple of contusions, but that was it. Um, fortunately, um, in writing the book, we found the family. Uh, I know finding the Nguyen family is like finding a family of Smiths over here or a family of chins in China. It's not easy to do. But we did find the family. I did interview Mickey. Unfortunately, his father, pilot, Bon Nguyen, was suffering from Alzheimer's and he couldn't speak in the interview. But he and the family, Bon Nguyen and the family, did show up for that reunion in 2010. And we didn't know whether Bon Nguyen actually knew what was going on because of his advanced Alzheimer's disease. But when that was shown on the screen, he saw his story being portrayed and he got very agitated uh, and began making sounds. And we had decided earlier, Captain Jacobs and members of the, of the, of the Kirk crew had decided they were going to give 
Bond to win an air medal for his heroism. They couldn't give him an air medal from the U.S. Navy. He wasn't in the U.S. Navy. But they got their hands on an air medal, and on behalf of the Kirk Association, at that dinner, at that reunion in 2010, uh, Bond Nguyen on signal wheeled his father to the front of the, of the room in his wheelchair. Uh, and then um, the citation was read, Captain Jacobs, and um, then Lieutenant Rick Sauter, who was the uh, head of the air detachment aboard Kirk, pinned the air medal onto Bond Bonnew uh, Nguyen's sport jacket. And he was impassive. There was no recognition on his face that he knew what was going on. But then he, stu he, he suddenly struggled to get to his feet. He motioned for his son to help him to his feet. And his son helped him to his feet, and he saluted. There wasn't a dry eye in the house when we saw that, because we knew he was there with us that night, and he witnessed this. He saw his story being told. Unfortunately, he, he passed on last year. He's no longer with us. But the family is around, and uh, there are a good number of Vietnamese uh, American communities that trace their origins back to this operation. That's the end of my prepared remarks. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Or if you have any questions you'd like to direct to, uh, to Hugh Doyle, I'm sure he would be happy to answer. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Right here. Very quickly, turn my ignorance here. The GS-12 that came on board the Kirk and took command, quote unquote. Who was that again? Richard Armitage. Richard Armitage, most recently, he had he's held several posts in the government. His most recent official post was Deputy Secretary of State under Colin Powell. Yeah. Yeah. But he's had several positions in DOD also. In the back. Uh, you mentioned the Philippines. How did they? Um, Handle well, that, that's an interesting story. Um, as this flotilla of South Vietnamese ships and Navy ships approached the Philippine coast, President Ferdinand Marcos, recognizing the new reality in Southeast Asia, said, they're not coming in my country. These ships are not coming in the Philippines, and nor are these people coming into the Philippines, which immediately initiated a, um, an international crisis. Of course, the Philippines, an ally of the United States, well, why did, why did, um, uh, why did Ferdinand Marcos suddenly decide he didn't want to have any part of this? Well, he recognized the new reality. The United States had just abandoned an ally, South Vietnam. Who's to say that the United States wouldn't abandon the Philippines? And so he began making nice to the North Vietnamese. He recognized the North Vietnamese government of all of Vietnam now, not just the North, but their consolidation of their power. He, admit, he, he recognized them very, very quickly. And the North Vietnamese demanded those ships back. Part of their fleet, the spoils of war, had been stolen from under their noses. And they wanted them back. Well, we weren't going to give them back. And we certainly weren't going to send the, North, the South Vietnamese refugees back to a very uncertain, unpredictable future. So some serious negotiating took place. And I was able to determine who did the negotiating. It was our ambassador to the Philippines, William Sullivan, who was a genius. He convinced Marcos. He had a good relationship with Marcos. He was one of Kissinger's boys, Bill Sullivan. He later became ambassador to Iran before the Iran hostage crisis took place. But he had the trust of, um, of, of certainly the people back at state, and he negotiated and he convinced Marcos. And it was done within five minutes. They were at a public uh, a ceremony commemorating the fall of Corregidor in 1942 to the Japanese, and he only had a few minutes. And he, he convinced Marcos by saying, those ships had been loaned to the Vietnamese under an agreement, they, the, the, the South Vietnamese no longer needed those ships. Could they come into the Philippines as U.S. Navy ships? And to sweeten the pot just a little further, he said, I know you in the, South, in, in the uh, uh, Philippine Navy have a lot of the same kinds of ships. I'm sure the Navy would not object 
or the US government would not object to you incorporating those ships into the Philippine Navy. Hands were shaken and the deal was. The ships would come in reflagged. South Vietnamese flags come down. US, uh, US uh, ensigns would fly from the masts of these ships as they came in. The ships would be disarmed. They would have to throw all that, all those uh, weapons into the sea. And, and um, Hugh has taken some photographs of, of a lot of those weapons being thrown. Uh, the, the breech blocks of some of the uh, larger guns had to be disassembled and thrown into the ocean. And they had to come in disarmed and under US flags. And they did. That doesn't answer your question. What happened to the 30,000 people on these ships? Uh, some of them were immediately put aboard transports that had, uh, of the military sea lift command or, or transports that had been contracted and were sent to Guam where there was a large, uh, where large um, uh, refugee camps were being set up to accommodate these people. Others were put on Grandy Island out in uh, Subic uh, for just a short time. And then they were also taken to Guam. So that's what happened with that. Other questions? Yes, sir. Were these all South Vietnamese or any Montagnards or, or uh, among, among No, I don't believe any of them were. Um, they may have been. I, we don't know the makeup of the people on the ships. The first refugees that came aboard in the helicopters were, these were upper class. These were middle upper class people who's, who, who knew pilots. But the people the th of the 30,000, we don't know exactly how many were Hmongs or how many were Montagnards. Just don't know. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I had a friend who ended up on another island there, a Vietnamese friend, and uh, in a refugee camp. I don't know what island that was. Set, well, tens of thousands. Of well, there was one on Guam also. There was, a, there was some refugees on Guam. Q? The, the island in Subic Bay was uh, Grandy Island in, uh, in the middle of the bay, and that's where the first stop, and then on to, uh, on to uh, a rotate point in uh, Guam, and from Guam, many of them went to, uh, to uh, Hickam Field, in the area of Hickam Field in Hawaii, and then on to four or five refugee centers in the United States, uh, Camp Pendleton, uh, Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, uh, Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania, and two others I just can't remember. But well, I'm just trying to think back there because this goes back a lot. But he was on an island for quite a long time, a year, a year and a half, two years. And he, it's an extraordinary, uh, he was rescued because a college friend of his, he had, he had been to Harvard, and a college friend of his, who's also a friend of mine, saw a uh, Boston Globe article and subsequently pictures in the paper and he saw the picture of his college friend there as a refugee penniless on this island and actually paid for him to come back to the States. He subsequently went back to Vietnam uh, I think two or three years later and unfortunately because he thought he could help the country because he was a professor uh, Reestablished himself, and he ended up in a re-education camp for five years. Well, I mean, it's kind of a sad story, but you know, the rescue from the island by a college friend. Yeah. No, no, that's Cute. You want to capitalize on that? At one point, he might have been. Uh, now, all this that we're talking about now took place in April and May of 1975. Uh, but the the boat people continued for 10, 12 years. Yeah, I was XO true. on Fanning years later in 1980, and we that's picked up three boats. And, but many of those people that were in the boat people group that were going to the Philippines over the next uh, 10, 12 years, uh, that wasn't all of them. A lot of them went the other direction, ended up going to Malaysia. Uh, that's probably the way it was. And, that's, uh, and there was a series of islands in, in Malaysia where there were camps, also under the UN auspices. I suspect that. Was right. 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 That's right. They were not in very good circumstances. No, no, primitive uh, yeah, in the extreme. Right, that second wave of, of the so-called boat people, these were the poorer people who couldn't get out at the beginning. But they would do anything to get out, including risking their lives on these incredibly unseaworthy craft. Yes, sir. Do you have any idea, was there much loss of uh, helicopters from enemy fire during this time? Uh, I, I don't, I'm not aware of it, although I do know that one, uh, one helicopter that landed aboard Kirk, and, and, and Q can talk about it, uh, it landed aboard and uh, they wanted to refuel and go back. So they took the, the I guess the pilot and co-pilot said, why don't you go below and get something to eat, we'll give you some food and whatnot, and we'll refuel your helicopter. We don't encourage you to go back, but if you want to go back, we'll refuel it. Well, 
when they started refueling it, it looked like one of those cartoons where you, uh, someone is, ma is machine gun and then he takes a drink of water and water is coming out over. <laughs> the whole, the, 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 the tanks of the plane, probably I think there were maybe three minutes of fuel left. Well, the rest of it had, had flowed out through the bullet holes. Uh, and there are other stories of other helicopters that had been shot down. Uh, they hadn't even gotten to, they'd just taken off when the Viet Cong or whatever fired on them and they crashed in Saigon. So yes, there are some incidents. I can't tell you how many incidents there are, but they were. They just pulled down the building, you know, the famous photograph of the embassy. Right. Uh, I was there in Saigon like two years ago. I took one of the last photographs of it. These guys said, you better, put, you better take it down because it's going. Yeah, well that building is not, is not the embassy itself. A lot of people no. think it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a side building Sorry. where that helicopter landed. Yeah. A very iconic picture. Yes, sir. Is there a substantial video of this operation anywhere? Well, I, uh, Hugh was nice enough to bring 20 videos uh, here, which I'll distribute. This is the Lucky Few, the documentary, uh, which the book came out of. Uh, if there aren't enough to go around, it's available on YouTube. You can actually see it on your uh, computer. Uh, and the best way to get in is just go to Google and go to USS Kirk on Google, and it'll, it'll route you to the link to the Lucky Few, and you can see it that way. And it's high quality. It was, it was put on YouTube by the Navy. Yes. So it's, it's a high quality. Mm. Any other questions? Well, again, thank you all for coming and thank you for having me.